Matariki is the Māori name for the star cluster Pleiades, also known as the Seven Sisters. Matariki is also the name for an international network of seven universities that are distinguished by their historic traditions and unique approach to facing contemporary challenges. The Matariki Lecture Series offers a short programme of lectures addressing current research themes or areas of common interest. This time, the lecture series is on race, racism and decolonisation, with a specific focus on racism and social determinants of health. Thanks, Michelle, and thank you to, um, to all of the speakers. Very stimulating, very interesting um, presentations. Um, some overlapping themes, I think, quite clearly, um, and also, yeah, some, some, some quite unique perspectives as well. Um, I was particularly taken by, uh, by Donna's, Donna's call for, not for less research, but, but the point that uh, not necessarily what we need is, is more research, but we actually need more action. Um, and I was just looking through a, a paper by Yin Paradis and his colleagues, um, which is a meta-analysis of the relationship between uh, racism and, and health. And they analysed 300, over 300 um, articles, um, which are you know, all scientific articles that are, that are proving this, this connection. So it's not that we need more evidence, we actually need to do something about it. Um, so yeah, there are a few uh, questions in the, um, the comments box and also thank you to those who contributed their questions earlier on. Um, so I think we'll start, there's, there's a couple of questions about what can, what can universities do in terms of, of um, you know, given, given their, their um, uh, position as training institutions, what can universities do to, um, to help to move us further along um, this, this pathway? But I think we'll come back to those um, and start with um, a question around, and it's a question for Pat actually, um, around, uh, and it's a question from Marilyn who asks, I'm interested in the um, racism versus unconscious bias uh, difference. Um, and unconscious bias, which can um, clinically uh, manifest as, as racism. Uh, might a lack of clinical, professional, and personal development also um, contribute? Um, yeah, look, I'm happy to answer that. I think there's been a question about unconscious bias, and it is, it is probably, it's racism. Um, that we haven't interrogated, you know, our thoughts and values and we make decisions based on that. And certainly where, where I use that, um, the research from the University of Sydney, I think it was, um, was when I gave evidence into an inquiry of um, police um, uh, brutality towards Aboriginal youth. So, um, so whilst they might not think of themselves as being racist, in actual fact they are. And uh, I think that accepting that, um, you know, we grow up and it's for all of us, it's not just a black white issue, it could be about gender and sexism, that, you know, you absorb the values and, and, and um, ways of your own society and you never question it. Um, same as racism, culture which is very profound, you know, I, because I did anthropology as my minor when I studied psychology and I loved the word, I learned the word ethnocentrism from, from um, anthropology and started using that in psychology before it became acceptable. But um, we do, we operate in, in our view, uh, going back to um, what Donna actually, uh, is it, um, yeah, what Donna was talking about, you know, we never question, we're not willfully... Um, seeing other groups as less than us or well mostly we aren't some groups do um, but um, but we we do have our own values and we judge everyone uh, accordingly now if we live in a society where the very fabric of that society um, is reflected in those values they become the dominant society, the dominant majority, and any marginalised groups or culturally different group are seen as, as odd and not fitting and lesser. 
and that enables us to um, to do acts of oppression, to make judgments. So I think, uh, to me, I haven't studied it in detail, but I certainly um, know its impact on the way that the state treats Indigenous people, and I'd say that would be for all marginalised people, that it's there and no-one ever questions it. So we do have to do anti-racist um, training. And um, later on, I'm going to talk um, I noticed one of the questions for me was about um, uh, uh, doing uh, how do we change education in universities because we're supposed to be the change agents. You know, we we are the leaders in intellectual development and 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 progress. But um, later on, I want to talk about the George. Um, uh, 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 the de the death. I'm blinked out. Damn. No, I'm I'm blink blanking as well. Yeah. George Floyd um, yes. and how that had an impact on all of us, black and white, and a good impact from a tragic. Um, but I'll hand over because I don't want to hog all the show. So, I like the point you're making, Pat, that, yeah, un unconscious bias is maybe a politer way of, of saying racism. And, you know, there's that standard thing of, um, um, you know, so, I, yeah, I, I'm not racist, but... Um, which is basically a way in which people kind of do the 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 the, the willing unknowing um, with the point that, that Donna's making that you deny the existence of racism. Um, did any of the other speakers have something to add about that question about racism versus um, unconscious bias? Okay, then we, um, oh, sorry. No, I thought that I build on a little bit of what, uh, what, uh, what Pat was saying and, and connected to what Donna was saying, because I think it's, they are very, you know, intrinsically related issues. Uh, what, when we say, we say that we don't need more knowledge, we need more action, which I absolutely agree on. Uh, um, what we say also is not that, we don't need more knowledge. We don't. We need the kind, the right kind of knowledge. I mean, to uh, to 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 change, you know, the paradigm of knowledge that we have been uh, teaching at universities and learning ourselves as well. And uh, I think, uh, um, I mean, in that knowledge is it it is uh, embedded the the the. I mean, racism is embedded in that kind of knowledge. So I think that. Well, yes, we need to do something with knowledge, but not not in the sense that we need to uh, to teach to teach racism away away because we're not going to do that. We're not going to succeed on that because the unconscious bias is so is so powerful. It's so powerful because it's embedded in the in our unconsciousness as well. <laughs> I mean, even in, in 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 the consciousness of those people who think that they have. Uh, you can, uh, you know, a rich kind of uh, anti-racist uh, consciousness. So I think that that kind of knowledge must be uh, deconstructed still, and uh, that is still a, a pending task for us. Thanks. Thanks, Irene. Um, let's move to... Um, this is a, a, a question for Donna. What in the New Zealand context would be the biggest thing the New Zealand government could do to help realise Māori sovereignty? And I, I think this is a really important question. I always, I, I did my PhD in New Zealand and, um, yeah, spent, spent almost 10 years there. And it seemed as though New Zealand was a, was a long way ahead of Australia in terms of its work towards reconciliation, if, if you want to use that, that term. Um, so what, what are your views, Donna, about the sorts of things that the New Zealand government from, from the policy um, and action level um, could be done to realise Māori sovereignty? Um, so I think it has to be fundamental constitutional reform and at the level of acknowledging that actually sovereignty was never ceded. So... Um, it has to manifest, I guess, as something more than like an attempt at some sort of partnership or power sharing. It actually has to be a, a devolve, a divestment of um, an unjust um, power. So, 
yeah, so I think it has to be much more meaningful than the sorts of um, discussions that are happening now about some sort of co-governance or co-sharing um, relationship, but which within which the Crown fundamentally doesn't actually um, acknowledge that it doesn't have sovereignty and doesn't do anything materially apart from sort of tokenistic treaty settlement processes to return um, what was taken. So essentially land back in the metaphorical and literal sense um, and an active divestment and moving away from trying to maintain power. At the moment, what I see in the health system reforms that we've just had and this shift to um, setting up a Māori Health Authority, it's still at a level where there's no acknowledgement that the Crown fundamentally has no authority to set up a Māori Health Authority because it has no authority on Māori land. So it's that conversation at a really fundamental constitutional level that Māori have been having um, in the Mātiki Mai project and the work of Moana Jackson and uh, Margaret Mutu as they went around New Zealand talking to people. But it's actually um, the Crown being prepared to have that conversation about its authority or lack of authority and what it would mean to actually um, have a constitutional transformation that looks something like what the Declaration of Independence in 1835 and the Treaty envisaged. Thanks, it's really interesting because yeah, New Zealand has this sort of the parallel health and education and, and kind of justice systems as well. And that sort of looks like a, a good thing. But the point you're making is that um, it shouldn't really be parallel, that, that there, there needs to be a recognition that sovereignty was never ceded, basically, and, and that's the point at which to start. So, yeah, interesting point. Um, would any of the other, do any of the, would the, any of the other speakers um, like to comment on sort of just flipping that around and thinking about um, your, your own country, so Sweden or Australia, what could be done to assist um, Indigenous um, or migrant minorities um, to, to achieve their, their goals. Irene. Yes, thank you. As I said, I think very, very shortly that I mean, uh, they, in Sweden, we are so far from the very recognition that, for instance, and I know that there is a lot of work to do still in, in New Zealand, for instance. I'm not saying that you have solved all, all problems and far away from that. But if you compare, I mean, everything is so relative. And if you compare uh, the situation of the recognition of colon the colonization of the northern territories in, in Sweden, the Sami territories. I mean, we are so far away from that. And uh, uh, there's a lot of work uh, going on. So I think, for instance, one thing that the authorities should start with is the very recognition of colonialism, that, that Sweden is, has been, is and has been a colonial state. And that is not, I mean, we are not there still. Secondly, what we, sh we need to do is to also to give uh, all you know the um, artifacts that have been collected in times of racial biology uh, at the for instance at our own university of solar university uh, in in the worst periods of colonialism i mean we need to start uh, also by giving giving back these artifacts uh, bones i mean uh, photographies and a lot of a lot of uh, stuff that is is, is uh, kept in the museums uh, in Uppsala and elsewhere in the country, uh, start a dialogue with the communities uh, and the very issue of representation. We don't have any representation of indigenous people uh, at all in, uh, at the universities in Sweden, with one exception in the, in the, in the Northern uh, University of Luleå. So, so I think that we have a lot, a lot, a lot to do in, in Sweden in that matter unfortunately, and we, we need to start that work. Thanks, Irene. Pat, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think our, our issue, we've got, um, you know, a lot of political um, uh, action happening with Uru statement from the heart. Um, so we're yet to, you know, we never had a treaty and, and that has to be one of the, the, the big movements forward. So very similar to, um, to New Zealand. Thanks, Pat. 
so yeah, as I mentioned, a couple of questions on the role that universities should play um, in educating the next generation um, around issues of um, anti-racism. Um, so this could this could be for for any of our speakers. So so maybe we'll we'll give uh, the floor to to each of them. Um, Pat, would you like to start? You're still, you're muted. Yep. Yes, say again, say again, Mark, for Rita. Mm. So what, what can we do, what, as, as university educators, what can be okay. done my to George, challenge? Yep. Yeah, my George Floyd moment. I, look, first of all, I think that um, the world has changed a little better, may I say. Um, because I've been, you know, uh, um, working in psychology since the 80s um, and seen a lot of change just in my own discipline. And I know that um, I think, you know, with COVID happening and then the George Floyd incident is a real big um, landmark moment for all of us um, uh, that people did not accept that type of um, racism anymore. And we had all the marches. We similarly had marches here in Australia. Um, what happened for us, though, it was our own staff, our non-Indigenous staff, who felt helpless and frustrated. So we got a statement up that our university adopted um, and we said how we, st we absolutely um, found this um, unacceptable, that we stood against racism, but we gave advice how people could, could um, engage in anti-racist behaviours. Um, um, meet an uh, Aboriginal group or visit an Aboriginal organisation, watch these videos, read these books. If you see racism, call it out. So we, we gave a lot of, um, of advice on what to do and that made um, our, our, our people feel better, certainly. But the Australian Psychological Society, our industry body, um, worked with the Indigenous, um, Indigenous Australian Psychologists Association and they put out a big statement on Black Lives Matter. So I think that was a galvanising moment where people had to, to figure where they stood and I think that um, people now are, there's still a lot of, you know, the implicit racism and systemic, but I think people are more aware of that and I think for me, um, and maybe I live in a bit of an ebony tower or something, but I feel that I'm meeting and talking to more people who want change. And um, next week, um, uh, uh, Belle and Joanna will be talking about the IPAP project that we do, you know, put, uh, to put Indigenous studies into the curriculum um, of psychology programs and to increase the number of Indigenous psychologists. And the response when we um, we started that was amazing. Um, so, you know, 20 years ago, we'd be chasing people to get them involved, but we were overwhelmed with enthusiastic uh, the in, enthusiastic responses and, and I think the discipline is proud that we're leading this and, and our thing is, you know, we don't judge people. They, you know, some of them might only be able to put a little bit of um, Indigenous studies into their curriculum, but as long as they're, they're starting, but we've built a community of practice so we can support and talk with each other and move to get to, together forward. So I think we need to challenge ourselves all the time I think that um, uh, where we are right now, though, my experience, and I hope I don't ever um, regret saying this, that things go bad and I say, gosh, I was naive back then. Um, but, um, but I think that um, basically our, our, our world is much more mature and, um, and they won't accept um, uh, 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 bad behaviour, bad incidents that are clearly um, uh, unfair and discriminatory. But I might be being a Pollyanna, time will tell, but I'll stop at that point. Thanks, right. Pat. Um, Donna, do you have something to, to add? About the role of universities? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I do think about this a lot as someone who works in a university, um, about what role they have, if any, sort of in a sovereign Māori future. I do think um, there is important decolonisation that can happen and needs to happen in the universities. Um, I worry a little bit 
as the same concerns I have about kind of the co-option of equity and, and some of the ways in which decolonization has kind of been co-opted as a term um, when it refers to sort of kind of like a superficial inclusion of um, elements of um, maybe authors who are outside of the canon and, and those sorts of things rather than again anything at a fundamentally structural level. So it's probably very similar to my answer about um, sovereignty at a national level is that these things have to happen like at a very deep, deep level um, and they have to involve both that sort of truth telling and reckoning but an actual commitment to a divestment of power and resources back rather than just a sort of um, adding some sort of Indigenous spice to your, <laughs> sprinkling a few Indigenous, you know, authors into your curriculum. Um, I do think that some really, and this is probably based on the experiences that I've had about some of the really powerful connections and relationships that I've developed where I've learned a lot and where I've been able to um, theorise and dream and imagine other futures has happened in those university spaces. So I do think there are, are places within the university where we can um, cultivate and um, some of the theorizing and work, um, collaborative work that's really important to sovereignty. But I think of them as more of like a transitional space and um, until we maybe, until we get or reclaim more of our own spaces to do, to do that work, so. I think that's probably my answer. Thanks, Donna. And Irene, have you got something to add? Yes, uh, thank you. I think uh, most of the things that, 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 that are important to do are said, but I would say I usually think about this, uh, what, what we should do at universities in three kind of uh, key words. And one is, the first one is representation. Uh, as I said uh, before, I think uh, we have a problem of representation, and I think I have my own experience. Uh, I, 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 I can, I mean, I know that representation is not uh, everything. I mean, it doesn't mean everything. It's just a, just a very, very kind of shy start. But it's important because you cannot pretend to uh, listen to the voices of the people that are not represented because I mean, they are not, they are not their voices anyhow. So I think that representation is, is, is underestimated and it is still very important. Um, I don't know which, which uh, mechanisms we could use, but affirmative action is one, but there are other uh, kind of uh, uh, active, you know, kind of policies that we could, we could explore. Uh, the, second, uh, the second, I think, key word is collaboration, and it has been a lot said about that here. I mean, we need to start to work with, or with, I'm, I'm doing that, and I know a lot of colleagues are doing that, but uh, not to go to the communities for just picking up information and then translating into academic terms. Uh, we need to work with, with. so we need, uh, we need with the communities. We need activism, we need action research, <clears throat> we need uh, co-authoring, I mean, not collaboration only in terms of saying that we are collaborating because we're talking to each other, but we need to, um, to, to explore much more the, the practice of co-authoring, which I think is really important. That, uh, of course, it's against what all the trends that, that are uh, dominating in uh, our universities today of meritocracy and, and uh, bibliomet bibliometrics and all this <laughs> very you know, neoliberal stuff. But I think we need to challenge that by co-authoring and co-working with the communities. And um, and 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 last but uh, but not least, I think uh, of course what we were saying also before the issue of uh, self-revision or self-grasping at uh, what is what is learned at universities, what is is being taught by. Uh, by us, by teachers, uh, the literature list, the authors, but also the contents, the kind of story of history that we are telling, um, the, the, the symbols that we're using at the academic, uh, you know, buildings, the kind of uh, traditions that we are trying to maintain. And some people are really, really afraid of, you know, kind of changing all that uh, very conservative traditions that are actually hinders for a work of the colonization of the academia. So I think this would be my three, my three key words for this work. Thank you so much.
Thanks, Irene, and thanks to um, to all our speakers. Some really interesting, helpful um, insights and and kind of practical as well as theoretical um, understandings, which which yeah, I think will be of benefit to all, all participants. Um, so thank you, thank you so much uh, to the speakers, and I will hand back to uh, Michelle now just to to wrap the whole thing up. Thanks. <laughs>